It's the 27th of July. What do you think was the critical point in the fortunes of the Jacobite Highland clansmen? Bonnie Prince Charlie turning back at Derby? The choice of Battleground at Culloden? I've got another suggestion for you and two songs for you if you watch this video. Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then why not subscribe to my YouTube channel, Scotland History Tours? Oh, also click the notification bell to make sure you're notified every time there's a new video. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. If you don't already know the causes of the Jacobite conflicts of the late 17th and early 18th century, then you might want to go back and watch my video, Jacobite Rebellion, or was it? There's a link up there just now. Otherwise, today I'm going to mention two songs and give you links to them in the description below. Now, in the comment section, please let me know if you already know the songs and their meaning. Now, if you've watched my video, Jacobite Rebellion, or was it, then you'll know that the rightful king had been overthrown in London. Now, I'm not an hereditary monarchist. I don't even want my kids to inherit my house. But if you were an hereditary monarchist and loyal to the king, then you would have been pretty hacked off. And that was the case for John Graham of Claverhouse. Some members of the English House of Lords had invited the Protestant Dutchman, William of Orange, to invade. And on the 18th of December, 1688, James VII, second if you're English, headed for the continent. I think he just knew Brexit was coming and didn't want to take any chances. So, England have changed their king, but what will Scotland do? You see, Scotland and England may have had the same king, but for a while they were still different countries. Somebody in Scotland needs to make a decision. So from the 16th of March 1689, the Convention of Estates met in Edinburgh. It was a bit like a parliament, but without the full powers of a parliament. Imagine the Welsh Assembly. Joke. The convention met behind closed doors, guarded by troops of the Presbyterian majority. Claverhouse smelled a stitch-up with rat-scented thread. Because you can buy anything on Amazon these days, can't you? Anyway, Claverhouse stormed out of Edinburgh with 50 dragoons. Now, the acts recounted in the Walter Scott poem, Bonnie Dundee, which has now become a rousing song. For those of you that don't know it, I'll leave a link. Right? The Corrie's version this is, right? Now, let me know if you know it or if you knew it, okay? On the 11th of April, the convention ended James's reign. But John Graham of Claverhouse, Bonnie Dundee, had already been away for a month, raising the clans. The country was dividing into Williamites and Jacobites. This is Blair Castle. It was held by the Dukes of Athol. Now, the first Duke of Athol took the Williamite side in this newly divided Scotland. The problem was that some of his underlings didn't. They occupied fortified a castle for King James. John Murray of Athol was barred from his own house and had to lay siege to try and get an entry. I've had to do that myself after a Sunday afternoon down at Boozer, I'll be honest with you. You're not getting in this house! I don't care who you think the king of this castle is! Money of Athol's Bailey inside sends word to Bonnie Dundee to come and rescue them from their besieging boss outside. The boss sends word to the government side, two armies, both underprepared, hot-footed to get to the castle first. A Williamite force under General Mackay was sent by the new official government. Bonnie Dundee represented the rightful king deposed in a coup less than six months ago. They were both in the right. Bonnie Dundee got here first, but way less men than he'd hoped. Mackay had to approach through the Killikanki Pass behind me, without the cavalry for which he had hoped. And when he came through the pass, Bonnie Dundee was waiting. It would be a clash of Highland and Lowland, Gaelic versus English, the rightful king against the chosen one. It was also professional soldiers, some crack troops returning fresh from wars on the continent against enthusiastic amateurs fresh from their Highland glens. 
If you like your whiskey with a twist of irony, Bonnie Dundee was a lowlander leading a highland army, and Mackay was a highlander leading a lowland army. Bonnie Dundee lured Mackay perfectly into his web so that the highlanders looked down on the red-coated troops below. The day began with skirmishes and standoff. Lowlanders shouting, Yarma! And Highlanders shouting, Urmahar! It's the same thing. The Williamite troops were twice their number, but eventually each clan group threw down their garments, charged downhill, fired one shot, and then held pell in the hardened British troops. Mounted in the front line, Bonnie Dundee stood up in his stirrups, raised his hand, and waved his hat to encourage reluctant horsemen. The hardened Williamite troops turned and fled. Ya fannies! Now that trivialises the situation. They reckon there were 1,800 dead redcoats and 600 dead Jacobites by the time it was finished. But there was no doubt that it was a rout. Now, the most famous of the fleeing government troops was a guy called Donald McBean. As he ran from his Jacobite pursuers, he reached the River Gary here. He was trapped with no escape. What does he do? He looked across the gap and in desperation he took a run and jump and made it to the other side of what is now called the Soldier's Leap. 18 feet, that's more than 5.4 metres if you're French. Sank Bergul Cat if you're a pedant. The point is, it's a death defying leap. But Duncan McBean would survive. Back at the battle site, Bonnie Dundee would not. At the point that he'd raised his arm to wave on and encourage his troops, he'd revealed a chink of unarmoured cloth. Now the chances of a musket ball making it through that minute gap were tiny, but the consequences were massive. And as he lay dying, Bonnie Dundee reputedly asked the soldier, how goes the day? The Highlander replied, well for King James, but I'm sorry for your lordship. The dying words of Bonnie Dundee were, if it goes well for him, it matters the less for me. John Graham of Claverhouse, Bonnie Dundee, was buried in the vault here at St Bride Chapel in the grounds of Blair Castle, whose staff had called on him for aid. And as he rests in here, and he's commemorated here, John Graham of Claverhouse might consider that the Jacobites had won the day, but they'd lost their inspirational leader. And without him, they failed to press home the siege of Dunkel to the south. The Battle of Killycrankie was early on in a fragile Williamite regime that hadn't yet established itself. If Bonnie Dundee hadn't raised his hand to wave on his troops, might the Jacobite cause have turned out differently? If the day had gone well for James and Bonnie Dundee, would it have changed history? Would we be singing about them today? If you enjoyed this video, then like it and share it. If you want to help me making more of these, then there's a link in the description below to tell you how. In the meantime, Hamian Dock is going to be a lot of my life. Cheerio and Rasta.